For IndieShooter.com, I'm Clint Milby. The new documentary, Descendant, follows the descendants of the survivors from the Clotilda, the last ship that carried enslaved Africans to the United States as they reclaim their story. The film was officially released on October 21st via Netflix and in select theaters. The film was shot by DP's Justin Swifak and Zach Manuel. We had an opportunity to visit with the team about the challenges of shooting in the sweltering humidity of the South and how the Canon C300 Mark I, II, and III helped them during their four years of production. Either one of you or both of you, like, tell me, like, talked a little bit about uh, your relationship prior to going into this project and how you actually got the job. You want to start, Jay? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I got the job. I was introduced to Margaret, the director, uh, through our friend Lauren. And uh, we shot once and kind of hit it off. And I was hoping she'd invite me back again. And she did. And then uh, four years later, here we are. Um, I've known Zach for shit, man, like 10 years. Has it been 10 mm-hmm. years? So, yeah, something like that. Yeah. And uh, Zach and I have been making images together for a long time, um, both as co DPs. Uh, Zach's also a director, and I've had the privilege of being a DP with him as a director. So we've had uh, a long time just shooting together and learning how we uh, make images and make movies and tell stories and share experiences. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I've learned a lot from from Justin in, in the years that we've known each other, especially you know, just about the craft of making images. And so, um, you know, I've been fortunate and grateful to, to oftentimes be able to kind of tag in when Justin can't make a day for, for, you know, a conflict or or some reason like that. And, uh, a couple years ago, I remember Jay hit me up and he said, yo, I'm shooting this movie. And, Actually, no, I think we shot it together, right? You guys needed a second camera or something like that. At the first, we might have done our first shoot together. Yeah. Yeah. So, I think so. I think so. Yeah. I don't remember. I don't remember being so anxious when I went in there, but um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Justin hit me up and he was like, oh, well. yeah, I'm movie. <laughs> he told me a little bit about what the story was and um, put me in touch with Margaret. And so I had a conversation with Margaret and, um, yeah, I really I liked I liked what she was doing and what her approach was. And I was just really interested in the in the subject matter. Um, yeah. And went on that shoot and loved it, lo- fell in love with the crew, fell in love with the town and the people that we were working with uh, in Africa town. And yeah, was super, super grateful to be on that project. It was amazing. So uh, talk a little bit about this whole uh, dual DP thing, because like I mean, most of the time and my experience has been one single DP because usually they're fairly maniacal and don't like to uh, uh, debate or share with other people. How did you guys uh, make that relationship work to make sure that whatever the vision was, that it was preserved no matter who was uh, who was shooting that day? Man, I've been maniacal not to shoot with Zach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, real talk. I mean, like, uh, you know, Zach and I, I mean, he said he's learned from me. I, I've, like, part of who I am as a shooter is because I grew up shooting with Zach, growing up, grew up, whatever, you know. Um, so, you know, there's a ton of trust. It's not... I, I, you know, I'm watching what he's doing and on, on other projects to inspire me. And so, you know, coming into this, it's, it's more like, um, wow, I wonder what Zach's going to bring to this and how can, how can I watch that and react to it? Um, there's a lot of trust there. And I think doc, the nature of documentary is you can have an exact idea of what you want to do but if if you're not listening while you're making a documentary uh and you're not adjusting and you're not responding to what's happening in front of you you're probably missing the mark so i think you know the idea of being a sort of control person in in documentary it's a balance between the control you have as well as being reactive to what's in front of you so I, i i speak for myself but you know 
it was especially bringing in someone who we, you know, working with someone who we trust so much, who I trust so much. And it was never really, a, you know, it was a blessing more than anything. Yeah. No, I, I think that's a great answer. I mean, I feel like trust is really what it's all about. Like in, in knowing how someone is going to respond to a certain situation. I mean, I feel like, especially in documentary, like we're, as DPs, like you have to do a lot of things at the same time. Part of what you're doing is a technical job. Part of what you're doing is, is the craft of image making, which is an art form. And then another part of it is the social aspect of it, which is how can you make an image with a community of people or with, you know, an individual and do it in a way that is comfortable and consensual and, you know, effective to the story. And I know that Justin is somebody who I trust a hundred percent to go in there, make a beautiful image, but also make people feel comfortable and also, you know, create a space that is transparent and allows people that kind of continual consent to say like, yo, I really appreciate the images that we're making together or, you know, now's the time when I'm not comfortable making an image. And so I think maybe that maniacal repu reputation of DPs comes from, when you don't really have that foundation of trust, but I feel like between us, like, you know, we could probably trade off anything, you know, theoretically, just because we've been able to, to kind of build so much trust over the years. And, you know, and it's not like I shoot exactly like Justin or Justin shoots exactly like I do, but I, I think that what we do is we have, we have a lot of respect for each other's work. I know I have a lot of respect for Justin's work and, you know, we have a lot of conversations. I'm, I mean, most, mostly I'm calling Justin like, yo, I'm about to shoot something. What should I do? So I feel like a lot of times I'm, uh, you know, I'm learning from him and I'm growing from watching his footage. And, and yeah, I think, you know, it's always like, okay, we're going in on this project. Let's watch some things. Let's see how you're responding to an environment, how you're framing stuff, uh, you know, outside of all the technical stuff. And then, um, yeah. And then, and then it, it just kind of opens up the conversation to, to what the process of making an image or making multiple images or shooting together will look like, you know, but I, I think it, it just comes from, we've worked together a lot and we, we really have a, a lot of respect to, and uh, appreciation for the way that each other works in the field. So talk a little bit about what was the uh, length of time of a physical production? How long were you guys uh, shooting for? Uh, I think it was four years, four, four, four and a half, maybe. Um, the in I, I believe it was in 2018. Um, they thought they had discovered the Clotilda, yeah. uh, and that was the beginning of um, Margaret coming to back to Mobile and and to the community of Africa Town uh, to tell the story. Um, obviously, then you know we had no idea what was going to happen. Uh, I think it was two, I want to say it was two years of shooting before they discovered the, sh maybe it was one, one and a half year. I can't remember the time difference, honestly, at all. It's a bit of a blur, but you know, not to spoiler alert, they discovered the ship, um, which happened about halfway through production. Uh, and then we just kept going. So um, I think it was a total of four years. Yeah. So where, uh, how'd that work then? So you'd shoot a little bit and then break or, or, I mean, obviously you weren't shooting like four years straight, right? 24 seven. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 Last four years of my life. Every nah, single day. Uh, nah, we would shoot and then, and then break, you know, and things would happen and, we, you know, we'd, we'd fly down or, uh, I lived in New Orleans at the time, drive over. Um, and, uh, we'd, you know, just sort of be ready to shoot um, at all times. And, you know, that's the other thing about working with Zach and working with someone you trust on a dock is like over four years, you're balancing other projects as well. And so you need to know that, I mean, the most important thing is that you're there to capture what happens, not that you're there to shoot it. So to have, you know, this, this relationship where we trust each other and could both be available between us um, was really useful. 
was it a situation where like i can't make it so you go down or did it work like that or were you guys always like together uh when there was a you know capture going on i think there i mean justin was the lead dp on the project so i, I think justin set the foundation for the look of the film and the feel um i want to say there were maybe a couple times when i was down there without you but i feel like maybe half the time I was shooting also we were together yeah or we'd be both there but split up shooting different things that were happening you mm -hmm. know sometimes uh when something was happening there'd be stuff in different parts of town or different parts you know we shot a lot in the community center and it's actually a really big space with a lot of things going on so sometimes we were there together but shooting separately there weren't too many times where we were doing like two camera coverage of things that I can remember. Maybe yeah. occasionally, but very rarely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so what this is, I'm kind of curious how you guys dealt with this. I'm, I'm from down south. And one of the worst things you have to deal with down there is humidity and how it affects like uh, your camera. Uh, how did you guys, did you have a trick to be able to like rush out and shoot something? Because I know I've, I've rushed out and like all of a sudden it's fog and then <laughs> you're screwed for like an hour until it adjusts or something like that. Man, I was just, all right. I was just telling this story actually. I'm on a shoot right now. And I was just telling, I was, uh, I was on a show on a, on a film last year and uh, we woke up in the morning, jumped in the car went to we're shooting in houston in august and it was you know hot and muggy humid i'm from new orleans so it's kind of just you know it's like a normal august day but uh not for sony cameras so we hopped out sorry sony y'all are great <laughs> but uh we hopped out the car we jumped inside went to the house that was ac and uh started shooting and it wasn't the fog like the fog was fine but um the camera pulled in moisture or something from the air and just totally fried it so I feel like I've learned, I don't know if we had that issue on Descendant, but I feel like I've learned from that experience to, you know, try to wait until the conditions maybe equalize a little bit before turning the camera on or just really trying to be really careful about that. You know, it's funny, like that is a problem in the South, but I don't remember having had that happening on descendant. Maybe the AC wasn't that strong anywhere we were. So it was just hot inside and hot outside. <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember that happening too often where the lens fogs up. I mean, it does happen in the South, but you know, also the humidity, the humidity is such a gift too, because, uh, you know, there's so much moisture in the air. And so it takes on the light. And, uh, you know, the, the, the light feels different to me in the South because of that humidity. Mm. And when there's like a slight fog in the air that sort of soaks up the light and soaks up the color. And there's a, there's a weight to the air. Um, and there's a weight to shooting there too, because you're, you're always feeling, you always feel the humidity, especially in obviously the hottest months. And so, um, I don't know, for me being in the South, you know, I lived there for eight years. So, you know, obviously Zach's been there longer than I have and, and sounds like you're from the South as well. And so you could probably speak better to it than I could, but I always felt like I had a stronger relationship with nature and with the, with the universe in some way, because you could feel it all the time. And uh, I feel like that sort of tuned me in a little bit to what was happening in front of me. Just there's a presence to that. Um, and you're sweating and you're you can just feel it so i think from both an image perspective and just like a feeling perspective there's the humidity is pretty awesome I, our canon cameras never uh or the alexa never i think never the humidity never fried them or anything like that no um, not in my experience yeah and you know the whole lens fog thing you just got to know when it's going to happen and let people know that gonna need 15 when we get outside before you can see anything or, or or put a lens outside that's ready to go so you can switch lenses when you get out mm -hmm. or pray you know i don't know <laughs> yeah. so talk a little bit about this i saw that there's a lot of uh sequences on the water obviously um 
that's kind of a nightmare in its own self. How were you guys, were you on land or were you on boats or both? Or, and uh, how did that go? All the above. Um, there were a few times, uh, I think very rare. I mean, there's one shot uh, of the horizon line that shows up twice in the film. And that was from uh, the beach. Uh, a lot of, there was one scene where we shot boat to boat. Um, when they discovered the ship, we were on a barge shooting from a distance. Uh, and then we actually ended up getting a lot of water shots much later in production, just like as texture for the film. And for that, we, uh, we rigged up um, uh a black arm with a Ronin two. This is when we finally had some money and um, we did uh, a little bit of like remote head stabilized stuff of the water just to kind of uh, put that texture in the film. Um, we had always sort of known that that was important, but never really had a way to do, had a way to do it as we wanted to until finally we had some good funding. So um that's how we took care of that. But yeah, there was a lot of boat to boat stuff. Um, good boat driving, thank God. And uh, yeah, I mean, a tripod on a boat can do a lot, you know? So, uh, What about, uh, were there night shoots or were you guys shooting at night at any point? Um, we did some stuff at night. Yeah. And, what was uh great there was graveyard stuff at night but um what were you gonna ask well uh, a lot of times bugs are a problem especially out in the country um they f they fly all over the lights and can really kind of distract from the shot uh do you have any secrets or anything like that into dealing with all that stuff so you got any tricks man <laughs> No, maybe, uh, maybe a plant light somewhere else that's not <laughs> hotter and brighter so the bugs go over there i don't know we we um i think the only night shoot that i did for that shoot is um we did uh we shot mobile's mardi gras uh yeah. during the springtime but you know i mean that was fine we were like kind of in the city uh so i don't remember bugs being too much of an issue I, you know, in, in doc, like, you know, we're not putting up lights usually at night. So, you know, any light, any bugs that are around the lights end up being kind of cool and add texture to the feeling. I feel like often, you know, you look up at the light and it's swarmed with bugs and it's always, I always find that to be a nice, nice moment. Um, yeah. You know, the harder part for me with bugs is like when like you're shooting and something important's happening and like there's like a bug on your face or you're getting bit by a mosquito um, and you're trying to stay still. Uh, That's the worst. I don't know if I have tricks except use bug spray, but don't spray it near the camera. Oh, yeah, because <laughs> yeah, you can't get it off the lens. Uh, that's for sure. Um, talk a little bit about what was one of the biggest challenges? I mean, to me, the the nature, uh, being out in nature, being in the South, uh, in the heat, in the water, there's a, there's potentially a lot of challenges there, but for you guys, uh, you know, on production there, what was, was there one challenge more than any other that stands out to you? Hmm. Z, you want to go first on that? Oh, uh, sure. I'll try. Yeah. I, I can't remember. I mean, sometimes the challenge with shooting Doc Verite, especially in the heat in the South, is just endurance. And there, were, I remember a couple, of, like a couple of times that we were shooting, where we were shooting a sequence that was happening, happening kind of continuously for maybe a couple hours, and it was all outside, and it was all moving. And so, you know, essentially, you're just walking with the camera for a couple hours in the heat, trying to keep everything in frame and in focus and reframe and capture the story and make sure no you know margaret or the sound person's not in the shot i remember that was like that day specifically just being physically one of the more exhausting days just because of uh yeah just because of the heat and kind of the physicality of what we were doing but yeah i mean i feel like 
I wasn't like emotionally exhausted. You know, I've been in experiences with, with different films before, but I, I really feel like we, um, yeah, just all the conversations that we had around this film, I think gave us the preparation that we needed to kind of go into certain moments and, and do what we needed to do and do, you know, what we had to do or kind of formulate an idea for what came next. So I didn't feel, yeah, that, you know, outside of the physical challenge, I think that was kind of the most of it for me. That's the sequence of Joycelyn passing out flyers, huh? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. That's so beautifully, man. Okay. Um, oh, go ahead. Did you have one? I don't know if I remember a specific one. I think for me, the challenge was like keeping vision over four years. Um, mm. It's a long time to like uh, have vision for something and have an idea of what you're doing. Um, and you, uh, you know, it was, it, I changed a lot as a shooter over four years making the movie and was working on other projects where it, which were influencing me as well. And, you know, so just sort of trying to keep a vision for what the film was over four years, I think was maybe the most challenging. Um, and, you know, re- we really just followed Margaret's lead on that. But um, yeah, that was it. There, if, it's hard to pick a moment, but that was challenging. Yeah. How'd, you, how'd you overcome that then? <laughs> I don't know if we did. I mean, I, I would say, you know... Um, there's an immediacy to the story and uh, it should feel that way because it was unfolding. Um, I mean, it's a story that's been passed down for a long time and that, that part of the story, you know, uh, was there, but it was being told to us in this sort of way where it sort of kept revealing itself. And so I think a lot of it was instinctual and very reactive to seeing what was happening in front of us and trying to reflect back what we were feeling from the community with our, with our camera. Um, and then, you know, there were layers of the film, some of the steady cam work and things like that, that came out of our sort of feeling um, that we were getting of this connection to ancestry and connection to spirituality, but sort of, weaves a a little bit of a stylistic point through the film um you know i i think the style kind of changes at times there were times we were on wide lens shooting close and times we were stepping back on a long lens so you know it has a sort of tapestry feel to it when i watch it back um that i think gives it an immediacy and doesn't make it feel overly constructed so i think on one hand you know, I, I want to say we kept vision, but I think that vision is loose. And um, Margaret, one of my favorite things about Margaret is she loves to continually surprise audiences. She doesn't like to get stuck in a rule or stuck in like one way of doing things. She's always looking for new ways to tell the story as you're going. And so the, the very challenge of doing that itself allowed the vision to have a fluidity to it. There wasn't like a rigid sense of like, we always have to make it look this way. It was actually encouraged to like, find a new way to capture this new feeling that's coming up. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. I mean, it was hard, you know, it was hard. And we didn't know going into it that it would be four years, you know? Sometimes you sit down when you're making a doc, you like the kind of know the whole story and, you're so like, oh, this is how it's going to look or this is how it's going to feel. And that changes too. But um, I had no idea the first time I shot for this film that I'd be sitting here five mm-hmm. years. So it makes me think about too, I uh, feel like w- one of the days I was shooting, we were trying to visualize, I think, what environmental racism looked like in Africa town and the challenge of trying to to visualize something that's so big, you know, that in some ways is really amorphous, but, you know, I think there's kind of, kind of the more obvious indicators of it, like a factory kind of looming over a small town. But we were like, remember like walking under bridges and kind of looking at, you know, where the ground and the, and the things that were growing out of it were kind of rotting and dying. And, and what were these kind of smaller indicators of environmental racism or pollution, uh, 
that, you know, I think if you weren't looking for them, you could just kind of walk past them. But uh, yeah, just, you know, I think moments like that really speak to Margaret's creativity and, and trying to visualize a story from all, ask, you know, from all different angles and all perspectives and, and to really look at the, the, the entire scope of a place to try to uncover the truth of it. And that was a real big privilege as a, as a DP to be able to work with somebody who's thinking about it like that. Yeah. It took a long time also to figure out how to shoot some of those kinds of things to like really tell the story of that, of a place. And I think a lot of the, you know, sort of shots of Africa town happened towards the end of production. It took like years to figure out how to really shoot it there. Um, just years of being there to like really see things in a way that started to make sense to me as far as telling the story. Um, and we also, you know, we brought in uh, Nick Ramey, who's a crazy, crazy talented uh, drone DP. Um, and the way that we worked with Nick is like, we kind of told him some of those things we were, some of those themes we were after and we just let him go just let him shoot and he'd show us dailies at the end of the day and be like, that's great. You know, or love what you're doing here. How can you tell this story now? Um, so took a lot of voices and a lot of uh, trial and error to kind of figure out how to shoot that place and to figure out what the vision was. Um, yeah. yeah. I think the goal is you're trying to, to the best of your abilities, visualize it the way that people who live there see it and feel it you know like you the way you can understand a place from just time and wisdom from just being there for so long and yeah a lot of times it makes me think about a lot of other films i've worked on too where like man the, the environmental b-roll some of the last stuff you do because if you go into a place and you're trying to you know capture the essence of it or capture what it looks like visually but you have no it's just hard to do without the the proper perspective uh so i think it takes a lot of patience and and it can be it can be a challenge, but I think it really is it's a it's just a process of knowing that you have to gain that wisdom and you have to kind of gain that knowledge through experience and through listening and through and through being in a space for so long, you know, and not just trying to create the most beautiful shot, but trying to create a shot that that has really truly honest perspective. Mm. So along the I mean along those lines and. I guess when we say something like racism, we're talking about a concept, not that it doesn't have real ramifications and real, uh, you know, things that affect people, but how do you take the concept of racism and this, and show that physically in an image? I mean, there are physical remnants of it, not even remnants. There's like physical, uh, sign posting of what racism looks like in Africa town. I mean, there's a scene where, where Joycelyn's riding around and she's looking at all these concrete, uh, plants are like, they're like land markers for the mayor family. And you can see pretty clearly that for decades, generations, they've owned these plots of land and they've taken more plots of land in and around this community. And then when you zoom out, you can see the community is basically just kind of cradled by this factory and covered in smoke, you know, half the time it's got a highway running right through the middle of it that that used to be an economic thoroughfare. So that kind of, I mean, that's that road itself is a transportation route, but it also is a symptom of racism. It's a visual indicator of racism. Um, I, the fact that there are no businesses in Africa town, the, the absence of economy in that way is, is what racism looks like. Uh, yeah, there's just so many, there's so many, man. And, uh, just, uh, kind of a last question. What was the decision process in regards to going, I guess you guys, uh, shot with the C 300, uh, Mark two and three. Um, and, and the and the first one too, huh? First one too. Yeah. So what was the decision process? Was this the camera that you had initially going into it or uh, was this a decision? And if so, like, what was the, what was the decision? What was the, what were the factors in that decision? Um, 
Well, Margaret owned the C300 Mark I going into it. So that sort of set us on a Canon trajectory. Um, but we also needed a camera that, uh, you know, if sound couldn't make it, we could shoot. Um, we needed a documentary camera that could be small, that you could build down um, and allowed us to be in the community and carry a relatively small footprint while still getting the images we wanted. Uh, I mean, you know, we were going into people's homes and we didn't want to bring tons of big gear that needed tons of support. Um, so we found something that made beautiful images and um, also allowed us to shoot from the chest and connect with people and um, tell a story like that. But I mean, originally it was honestly just what we had. That was what we had when we started. Uh, and there was some Alexa in there too for some of the steady cam sequences, but, um, but the majority of it was shot on the Canon. And the lenses you guys were using, were they cine lenses or were they uh, 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 just the EF uh, photo lenses? When we shot on the Canons, we shot mostly the EF photo lenses. And how did those work for you or, or what were some of the assets of utilizing those lenses? Um, I mean, they were great. I think the L series is awesome. Um, at the beginning, we, you know, we're using mostly zooms and uh, as we sort of found the story more, we switched over to like shooting on a 35 a lot. Um, but some of the meetings we, you know, shot on a 70 to 200 L series, or I think that's an L series, Canon EF zoom. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're great. They're, those are, that's great glass. I, I love that stuff. I mean, it's super versatile. It's really durable. Um I don't know, Zach, you've shot a lot on those lenses too. Do you have any? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think they're, they're just really solid, flexible lenses. I feel like, um, when I came on board, you, you were shooting, I remember this, you were shooting on this, uh, I think it was the 17 35 or the 16 35. And, um, I was coming off of another shoot that was like, like all 70 to 200 so it kind of opened my eyes i was like blown away i was like man this is beautiful man it's gorgeous and the you know we're working with like a 235 aspect uh matt on the on the on the frame yeah i really i enjoyed it i mean they're they're like they're nice they're they're lightweight they're easy to work with they're very approachable they're, they're just like they're kind of like workhorse lenses and you know they're not like trying to do anything super crazy but i think you know a lot of times with doc it's just kind of what you're doing what you're responding to and not how how crazy you're getting you know for some so, of the, oh go ahead please no i was gonna say for some of the steady cam stuff um steve cruel at panavision helped us uh get um a lomo round front for some of it and uh, a panavision t-series and a morphic for some other stuff so um it was nice in conjunction with the sort of more verite feel that we had on the Canon lenses that these other sort of sequences, um, we sort of went for something a little more specific uh, for those steady cam sequences. Was uh, uh, the progression into the Mark II and Mark III, uh, that was obviously a decision that we wanted to, you guys wanted to stick with the, the Canon. Uh, um, how did you find that the new cameras, like, did, was there some added value to, uh, you know, as you progressed and upgraded your cameras? Um, well, the Mark III came out right when I think we got, f like, full funding, I want to say. And so we decided to purchase a camera and had been going with Canon the whole time, so wanted to keep it in the Canon family. Um, but the Mark III's, I really uh it's it's a beautiful it's a beautiful image and we shot 12 bit raw uh for it so um i i really like that camera um i shot another series on it after uh descendant um it has a fantastic color space it's super you can build it down um yeah i, I mean 
but at that point, I think we were just like, let's stick with Canon Log and keep going. And and so, uh, yeah. So, what file format were you guys shooting? Were you shooting to card uh, the uh, the the uh, Canon files, or were you utilizing like an Atomos or something like that to uh, get ProRes? No, it was all internal. Um, man, I'm the worst with file formats. <laughs> I don't remember what file format we were shooting. It was 12 bit raw. Uh, I want to say actually on the Mark three, we use C log two, not three. Uh, and, um, like the production camera color matrix and cinema gamut, um, whatever the largest file for, you know, we shot raw, but I don't remember, like, it's like in an MXF wrapper, but I don't, I don't really remember anything beyond that information. And so, just, and, oh, go ahead. Record. No, I just press record. Man. <laughs> <laughs> a, really, a really good support. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sure um, I'll be able to tell you. No, it's cool. Uh, so the, the, Last question: Would you uh, would you utilize the Mark III and the EF glass again? Um, and have you? Z, you want? What do you, I mean, yeah, I would. You know, I've I've been. Um, I, I'm sorry to say, I've been rocking with the Sony's. I know me too. Damn. <laughs> so here's here's the thing, man. Like I I, I own an FS7. I bought one in 2014 like when they first came out um so you know i mean the thing about documentary is it's so much about comfort it's so much about like being able to jump into a space and just kind of know exactly what you got to get and how you're going to get it and eliminate like the majority of difficulties and variables as possible so i i found a lot of comfort working with sony's which isn't to say that i can't you know jump in and, and roll on a can on a cannon um would I do it again? A hundred percent. I would totally shoot on it again with the EF glass. I shoot on my Sony with EF glass all the time. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, everybody's got, I feel like everyone has their camera that they just, you know, it kind of like, it has to become your, your right hand or your left hand, you know, after a certain amount of time or else it's, I, yeah. yeah. I, um, I shot another series on the Mark III uh, called Keep Sweet and uh, I found it a fantastically versatile camera as far as being able to light interviews with it and shoot verite with it. I find that it responds pretty well to uh, artificial light. And on on Descendant, we used mostly available light, but on this other series, Keep Sweet, um, we, we were lighting. And so, uh, you know, I, I found it to be extremely versatile in that sense of like, I could shoot available light or I could light things and it still looks pretty good. Um, I also shoot a lot on Sony. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's really project dependent, but I, I would hundred percent use the camera again. Um, and I think you have, I, I think honestly the L series primes are really good. I mean, the zooms too, but those L series primes are fantastic lenses the photo ones and i think it's actually i don't quote me on this but i think it's the same glass they put in their like some of their cine lenses it's just different housing and when you're shooting documentary and you're pulling your own focus you know you, you want the housing to actually be light and small and the focus throw to not be so big because you can't if you if the focus throw is big you're doing this whole thing where you're like you know trying to spin the lens to get close and you know <laughs> yeah, it's like you know so the the photo lenses are uh are good um but yeah so the uh the film right now is on um it's on netflix and it's looks like it's gotten a ton of awards is that right I think it's doing all right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's doing great. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad, man. People, people are really watching it. You know, I mean, it's yeah. Yeah. it's such a historic story. You know, it's such a an American story, but like in in this really visceral way that draws a straight line between the slave trade and where we are today. And so, you know, for that 
for that reason, I feel like it's a very necessary story. Um, and I'm happy that it has been getting the attention that it's been getting and the awards, you know? Yeah. I hope, I hope it gets an even wider audience as it continues to go, uh, be out there. Mm-hmm. People want to find out more about you guys. What do they do? Um, is there websites and stuff like that that you guys have? Or Don't check my website because I have enough. <laughs> <laughs> Personal websites like from the 80s or something. <laughs> I'm, I'm rocking GeoCities, basically. <laughs> yeah, check out my MySpace. <laughs> yeah, right. I have a Tumblr. <laughs> oh, shit. No, nah, um, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean... Um, Instagram, I feel like is probably the best uh, way to keep up with what I'm what I'm working on. And, and what's your Instagram handle? That's a good ass question. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's well, Zach Zach. Put, is it? <laughs> it's Zach Zach Z A C Z A C underscore underscore. <laughs> All right, we'll get that. And uh, <laughs> what about you, Justin? You can look at my website, justinswifeact.com. Z-W- Say it one more time for me, please. Justin, I'll spell my last name. Z W E I F like Frank A C H dot com. <laughs>